A very good afternoon to all the attendees and to Professor Peter Laxman. I welcome all of you in this webinar series by Distinguished Experts, which is being organized under the aegis of our DBT Star College program at the India Lopathiya College, University of Delhi, jointly with the National Academy of Sciences India Delhi chapter. Today we have talk by Professor Lackman on the influence of infection on societies before COVID-19. The customary, I'll introduce Professor Lackman, who was the founder president of the Academy of Medical Sciences and held the position between 1998-2002. He is Emeritus Sheila John Smith, Professor of Immunology in the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of Christ College. He is trained in medicine at Cambridge and University College Hospital and obtained a PhD and DSc in Cambridge in Immunology. His principal research interests are the immunochemistry, biology and genetics of the complement system, microbial immunology. Particular topics include microbial subversion of the innate immune response and the immunology of measles, enhancement of the immune response and its relevance to vaccines, immunopathology, particularly in relation to systematic LE and to multiple sclerosis, insect sting allergy. He was the founder president of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, 1998 to 2002, and has served as its representative on the Inter-Academy Medical Panel Executive from 2000 to 2006. He has been biological secretary of the Royal Society from 1993 to 1998, and the president of the Royal College of Pathologists from 1990 to 1993 and served on UNESCO's International Bioethics Committee from 1993 to 1998. In these capacities, he has become involved with the ethical and policies aspects of medical science, particularly in connection with public health, vaccination, step cells, transmissible spongiform, encephalopathies, and genetically modified crops. I welcome Professor Lackman, and I also would like to thank uh, Professor Ajoy Katak, who is the chairperson of the Nasi Delhi chapter, our principal, Dr. Heng Chen Jen, my colleagues at the MHRD Institution Innovation Council and the DVT Star College program, who have helped me a lot in organization of these webinars. So over to you, Professor Lackman. Just for humans, um, even viruses have problems, uh, bacteria have problems with uh, infections, having bacteriophages, which were always considered to be a possible therapeutic for bacterial diseases and still are but it's not really reached yet reached their fulfilled their promise there are epidemics in plants um, dutch elm disease and ash die back in the united kingdom and of course there have been big epidemics in in animals such as seals who were largely wiped out for a long time from a measles like disease um, some decade or two ago but one of the most interesting observations um, on infection is the analysis by William Hamilton, who was Richard Dawkins' mentor, that primitive animals which have the option between sexual and vegetative reproduction always choose sexual reproduction. And his analysis shows that this is in order to attain immunity, uh, diverse, diversity of immunity generating genes. And he concludes that the reason for having sex at all is to combat infection. So it has its functions. If we just look back now or forward at the timeline of the universe, see what we're talking about. If we regard the 15 billion years of the universe as being one year for the moment, then the Earth is about four months old. The earliest life, the archaea, uh, you still get in deep ocean vents are about 11 weeks old. The first vertebrates are about 11 days old. First mammals, six days. First primate, 32 hours. First monkeys, 19 hours. The last shared ancestor of men and chimps, about three and a half hours ago. The origin of Homo sapiens, this is very slightly, but it's, it's four minutes or perhaps a little later, but not more than eight minutes ago. And the agricultural revolution, which had enormous influence on man's relation to infection, occurred about 21 seconds ago uh, in the history of the universe. So you can see that there have been only about 4,000 generations of humans, give or take, uh, 
and E. coli goes through 3,000 generations in about two months and has undergone a little significant change in that time. And mice do the same in 650 years, and they also have not undergone huge genetic changes in that time. So we're dealing with things where genetic change, there hasn't been that much time of uh, genes to vary in 4,000 generations. Now the agricultural revolution had an immense effect on human infectious disease. Before the agricultural revolution, humans lived in small itinerant groups who had no domesticated animals. Afterwards, they lived in much larger groups and increasingly larger groups to the present day that are able to maintain endemic infections. They had permanent settlements that pro promote contamination of their water supplies with their own excrement. And perhaps above all, they started keeping domestic animals who were able to spread their infections um, to humans, a process they are then known as zoonoses. And it's really very likely that the agricultural revolution greatly enhanced humanity's infection burden, their whole relationship, their whole problems with inf infection. Uh, this slide is taken from a lecture by Robin Weiss um, uh, about zoonoses. And you can see um, they go back a long time, malaria, probably about 8,000 BC, smallpox, probably from a ruminant, about 2,000 BC, tuberculosis, about 1,000 BC. And these are all diseases caused enormous problem until very recently, and some do still. Uh, typhus, um, probably in the plague of Athens, and then again in Spain. What we call plague, Yersinia pestis, which is a bacterial plague, gave rise to some probably still the greatest plagues in history. More recently, dengue passed from monkeys about a thousand years ago. Yellow fever, 1641 in the present era. Spanish flu, we'll say more about. And then AIDS, which we'll also say some more about. Which came from Z, age one, 30. Who came from among any of the diseases which worry us still are in fact derived from animals. And these are just a list of some recent ones. You needn't go through all of them all. But the big E. coli 157, which is the dangerous E. coli, Scotland in 1996, Ebola in Zaire in 2000, um, bird flu H5N1, very dangerous form of flu um, with a very high mortality. Uh, originated in Hong Kong in 1997. It has very high mortality in humans when it infects humans from birds, usually from chickens. But very fortunately, uh, the H5N1 flu does not allow infection from human to human. And for this reason, has proved no major danger to humans as yet. If it were to acquire this capacity, that would be quite another matter. This is from a, a, a very well-known book on matters of life and death by John Cairns. It is a history of mortality largely taken from tombstone evidence. And it shows two patterns of mortality. This one is probably goes back to the most ancient of times. In cities, although these are just two in Europe, I doubt if it's very really different anywhere else which was a situation where half of everybody was born, more or less, was dead by the time that they were five. So there was enormous infant and childhood mortality. And they then died at a fairly regular rate, going down so that half of the rest of them, from about 50 to about 25, half the rest of them were dead by the time they were 50. And nearly all of them were dead by the time they were 75. And that is contrasts with this squared off mortality curve. This is taken from English mortality figures in the 1990s, but it's true in much of the developed world is that de from natural causes before the age of 60 is getting relatively uncommon. Thereafter, there's a much accelerated form of death in late ages and later ages, and that has increased recently so that the modal age of adult death in women is now over 80, and in men is about 79. 
So there have been huge differences brought about by modern science. The consequences of the original form of mortality um, that Cairns describes uh, were considerable. Humans were probably unique in being aware of their mortality from a very young age. And they always knew they were going to die and they observed it all around them. This gave rise to an impetus to believe in life after death or in reincarnation and to religions that promise these. But that is probably not what gives religion the a survival value in society, it is their prescription, the thou shalt and thou shalt not, that give their survival value as mediators of cultural evolution as opposed to genetic evolution. And these prescriptions usually have nothing to do very much with morality as we understand it, but have to do with matters such as what you eat, your sexual habits, how you travel, and things of this description. And a number of these prescriptions you will see uh, have survival value that is clearly not why they were introduced. I mean, prophets didn't go into the deserts to see how they could reduce spongiform encephalopathies, for example, which they would never have heard. But cannibalism, which is forbidden in many societies, uh, almost certainly those who forbid cannibalism do much better because they don't get spongiform encephalopathies like Kuru in man or BSE. Um, and here there's a Current example, the Fori tribe in New Guinea who practiced cannibalism were almost wiped out by an epidemic of Kuru in the early 20th century, which was only put an end to by the Australians who then governed New Guinea and prevented the Fori tribe from being um, exterminated. They did not eat their enemies. They ate out of respect um, for the, those of their relatives who died and whereas the men had largely the muscles, the women had largely the brains, and they were particularly affected by Kuru. Male circumcision, um, one doesn't really know why various religions uh, decided this was a good thing to do, but there's no doubt that it protects from sexually transmitted diseases. In recent years, we have direct evidence that male circumcision reduces the spread of HIV and AIDS, it's probable that happy and syphilis um, is also spread somewhat less um, by those who are circumcised. These diseases are all potentially lethal, but the same is true of gonorrhea, uh, and that also has important consequences for societies because gonorrhea gives rise to infertility in women. And in the days when man was an endangered species rather than an endangering species, which we'll come back to, that was also very important. Uh, many, but not all, religions advocate monogamy, and of course, strict monogamy present, prevents most sexually transmitted diseases if it's rigidly adhered to. There are many dietary restrictions. A good example are mollusks who feed on sewage when given the opportunity and if eaten uncooked, carry multiple infection risks. Eating pork carries the risk of being infected with the Trichinellus spiralis, which caused human, serious human disease uh, over the long ages before one cooked the pork properly. Personal cleanliness, particularly in reducing infection with lice and fleas, um, though that was not the reason it was advocated, will prevent plague and typhus, among other infections. And personal cleanliness uh, is highly regarded in some, but by no means all religions, and is actually curious that Christianity has no particular prescription for washing. In fact, it's well known in ancient literature with the odor of sanctity, which was the smell you appreciated when you approached um, those who... Um, sat on the top of great pillars without access to lavatories for long periods of time. Can you still hear me? I hope so. A number of... Yes, yes. Um, good. Important fan... It's very strange for me not to be able to see my audience. But I hope you're still all there. There are a number of historical pandemics that we know about that had huge effects on society. The Athenian plague between, you can read it here, 
413, 426 BC during the Peloponnesian War was probably a major contributor to the fact that the Athenian Empire fell and the Spartans did not. The organism causing this plague is not known. Um, a number of organisms have been suggested um, as partly from contemporary descriptions, partly from looking for nucleic acids in, in bones that have been exhumed um, at the sites. A number of things have been suggested, typhus, smallpox, measles, flu, um, and it's not known. Typhoid's also been suggested, it's very implausible. Probably typhoid could be found, traces of typhoid could be found in buried bones from most people in those sort of ages. It's estimated that 25% of the Athenian population died, which is between 75 and 100,000 people. But 25% of the city's population, of course, is enormous. It has a huge uh, sociological effect. Another enormous plague somewhat later, between 165 and 166 AD, was the Antonine Plague um, in, in Rome and around that, and it's likely to have celebrated the fall of the Western Roman Empire. This is believed to have been smallpox and is believed to have killed between three and a half and five million people. Again, um, in the Western Roman Empire, this is a highly percentage of the population, and undoubtedly would have hugely influenced their ability to resist barbarian invasions from the north. Though probably one of the greatest plagues of all times that we know about, and I apologize here that I know about is largely from the Circum Mediterranean region in the west, and I know much less than I ought to about plagues in India, where you will probably know much more than I do. But the Justinian plague, which lasted for a huge amount of time, um, getting on for 200 years, uh, decimated the populations of both the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, and it's believed to have killed about 100 million people worldwide, which is a very large percentage of the population of that part of the world. This was caused by the plague bacillus, and it's described quite clearly as there being bubo's present, so this was undoubtedly plague. Sorry? Sorry, I can't hear you. No, no, sir. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, as I was saying, this, is, this really was plague. This uh, went on for ages and decimated both the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, which were the two, there's the Sasanian Persian Empire at that time, uh, who were the two major powers in the Near East. And it is likely that this patamic pandemic facilitated the Arab conquests of the Near East. There's a very good book about this by Tom Holland called The Shadow of the Sword, and he believes actually that the Arab conquest preceded the rise of Islam rather than following it. The Arabs lived very far south in Arabia where there were no rats, and they therefore were immune from being infected with the plague. And in, when they therefore sent armies north, they were hardly resisted. And then Islam developed uh, as a way of dealing with their conquered regions. It's interesting, very interesting book. Um, another absolutely catastrophic plague, particularly well all over Europe, but also very particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, was due to Yersinia pestis again. This was came in again from the east, it was a catastrophe. It's believed to have killed about a third of the population of much of Europe over just a few years. It caused, among other things, um, the end of serfdoms, particularly in England and probably in some Western countries as well. And the second waves of this plague continued for centuries in Europe with intermittent outbreaks. And the last substantial one of those in the United Kingdom was the Great London Plague in 1665. And after that, it declined quite rapidly. And that is believed to be due to the fact that the rat which carried the plague and the alternative host um, was being replaced by the brown Norway rat from the native black rat, 
and that was less susceptible to the plague and helped in its decline. It may also have helped, I suppose, that people began to wash rather more, one thinks. And these are a number of diseases which I'll just talk about in slightly more detail. Smallpox, I will talk about in a minute. This is remarkable because it's the first disease that's been eradicated worldwide with a huge effort um, in which India played a substantial part. And unfortunately, the civic obedience that enabled smallpox to be eradicated is no longer found for other diseases. For example, measles, another much more serious disease than is often realized, which is endemic everywhere, it was well on the way to being eradicated before vaccine objection actually originating in the United Kingdom caused a great problem with that and it's still not fully eradicated. Flu has been with us for a long time and there are epidemic and worldwide pandemics. Flu is a very odd virus because it doesn't it has its genome in separate bits so they can reassort um, which enables them to change their genomes rather quickly. The last really catastrophic flu pandemic was in 1918 following the First World War where it's killed probably more people than were killed during the war. Also spreads among other species. Yeah, I mentioned the first time COVID-19 which we'll mention just at the end again it's, but it's interesting that this is obviously worldwide, highly contagious. We have neither treatment or vaccine yet available. HIV, which is the previous, most recent introduction, and I will say more, more about that, uh, there has been great progress in treating it, but we, it is still a, a huge worldwide problem. Bacteria, two diseases which have been of tremendous importance in human history for a long time, TB, I'll say a word about, and syphilis, which is the most feared sexually transmitted disease before the invention of antibiotics that cured it. And malaria is a very interesting example. It's been about forever and ever, had an effect on human genetics, as we'll see, and it remains a huge problem. I'll say a bit more about that later too. Tuberculosis, very ancient, found in Egyptian mummies. Um, and it's a very complicated disease. Infection rates are hugely greater than people who actually suffer clinical disease. In my generation still, 85% of people, including me, um, by the time they were first tested in adolescence or as a medical student, had positive tuberculin reactions and had to go and focus on the uh, chest x-rays which shows that there was a, a small area of lung consolidation with some calcified lymph nodes in the mediastinum and that was extremely common and not associated with disease in most cases. Nevertheless, in the 19th century it caused 25% of all deaths in England in 1815. Men are be totally reliable and 16% of France a century later and the fear of TB in the 19th century, as you could tell from a great deal of literature, is very much like fear of cancer in the 20th century. So the introduction of drugs that treated tuberculosis was an immense contribution to human welfare, but nevertheless tuberculosis remains a senior problem. Firstly because of drug resistance, uh, which is an increasing problem, and also because its association with HIV uh, which tends to reactivate tuberculosis. HIV actually is two different diseases. There are two different lentiviruses, which are quite different and originated in different places. HIV-1, which is the more severe one, came from chimpanzees in Central Africa. HIV-2 from sooty mangabees in Western Africa. They were both probably spread from uh, these monkeys by the injection of bushmeat or eating of bushmeat but above all the injection of monkey tissues into humans as part of native medicine in Africa and spread to humans probably occurred in the 1930s but it became very widespread in the 1980s and that is probably from the use of syringes and needles left behind by vaccine programs 
previous to that, they'd used glass syringes, which they always took back with them because they could use them again. In the 1980s, I'll show you in a minute, plastic syringes came into the widespread use, and they tended to be abandoned. So they were then reused by native medical practitioners to inject monkey tissues, and in that way, they probably spread HIV very widely, quite quickly, before it was spread sexually. And then, having been introduced into the Western world, it was spread by sexual transport. Originally, a lot of human homosexual male contact, but also by other forms of sexual contact, and of course by blood products. I'm treating hemophilia became a serious problem, and needle sharing by drug take takers. Um, HIV leads to a severe drop in CD4 T cell numbers, therefore has a major effect on antiviral immunity and in the immunity to TB. Um, treatment of HIV was a great success for the drug industry. They did make these antiprotease inhibitors that are highly effective. It nevertheless remains a major and serious worldwide problem. Uh, this is just to give you some example of this use of syringes. You see here, this is the use of disposable plastic syringes, which increased enormously from about 1950 to 1960, which is also when HIV really begins to appear. Um, it is really rather sad that Gavi and the people who were promoting vaccination in Africa for the best of possible reasons did not realize before, uh, in about 1950, that leaving syringes behind was an extremely dangerous thing to do. And now, of course, every syringe <laughs> is carefully accounted for and destroyed. But it's unfortunately much too late. Smallpox is still possibly the most devastating, or was the most devastating of all infections. The ancient origin was in the old world, not in the Americas. Smallpox allowed the conquistadors to conquer Mexico rather than their superior fighting ability. Cortes had a slave with him incubating smallpox in his entourage. And there was a huge outbreak of smallpox uh, in and around Mexico City. And that was is now regarded as the proper reason why the Spaniards were so able to, so readily to conquer Mexico. And something very similar happens in the conquest of Peru. Very shamefully, smallpox, even before it was known what it caused it, um, was used as biological warfare. And it is known that the British Army left smallpox contaminated blankets for Amer Native Americans the siege of Fort Pitt in 1763. The disease was artificially prevented originally in the Far East, and this spread west to Turkey, where it was widely practiced, particularly for their Circassian women slaves. The Turks were quite clear that it really didn't matter if a few of those died of smallpox, providing the rest of them weren't pockmarked, and they used it quite widely. And it was from Turkey that it came to Europe and eventually led to vaccination and eradication of the disease. This is the Lady Mary Mortley Montague, who was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey in the 18th, early 18th century. I think this is a slightly improved portrait because she's known to have had smallpox as a child and presumably had a pockmarked face, but um, that's been edited out. She wrote a famous letter to one of her friends in England in 1717. Um, you can read it yourself. She says, the smallpox so fatal and so general amongst us is entirely made harmless by the invention of ingrafting, now called variolation, which is the term they gave it. Every year, thousands undergo this operation. The French ambassador says pleasantly, they take the smallpox here by way of a diversion as they take the waters in other countries. There is no example of anyone that has died in it. That, I'm afraid, is completely wrong. But she obviously believed it. And you may believe I'm very well satisfied on the safety of this experiment since I intend to try it on my dear little son. I am patriot enough to take pains to bring this useful invention into the fashion in England, and I should not fail to write to some of our doctors very particularly about it. 
If I know any one of them that I thought had virtue enough to destroy such a considerable branch of their revenue for the good of mankind. And she clearly didn't have much of a good impression of the contemporary British uh, medical profession. But actually she was wrong. Variolation was rapidly introduced into England um, and was quite widely used in the 18th century. But it had disadvantages when a child has been variolated. Variolation meant taking a little bit of smallpox pus and just sticking it into the skin with a needle. But the child was potentially infective and was often put into isolation so they couldn't infect anybody else. And this happened to Edward Jenner, who we'll more about in a moment. Some of these children also got serious attacks of smallpox and some certainly died. It was known to farmers in the 18th century that those who had contracted cowpox, usually dairy maids who milked infected cows, were resistant to smallpox. And we know that a farmer called Benjamin Yeste inoculated his wife and sons with cowpox pus in 1774. But since he had no method of testing whether it was infective or not, um, this was largely ignored. The same experiment was done by Edward Jenner, who was a scientifically very curious and interested and talented country GP who became a fellow of the Royal Society uh, not for his work on vaccination but for his work on cuckoos um, so he had a wide background he's been a pupil of a, a major figure which surgeon John Hunter who had a Hunter collection in London of all sorts of interesting things and he did the same to one of his patients in 1796. He injected him with cowpox. In that case, however, he was able to variolate him some weeks later uh, and found that there was no reaction. And he was able to publicize this, this finding with great effect and led to the introduction of vaccination with cowpox. And here are two interesting books on this subject. Huge influence on human mortality at the time. Here he is. This is a sort of glorified picture of James Phipps being variolated. And here's the first example of vaccine rejection. You can see these people who've had this cowpox. Here's somebody growing a cow from their nose, somebody growing horns from their head, bits of cows emerging from various parts of their bodies, while Jenna just goes on vaccinating people. The wonderful effect of the new inoculation and the publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. So there's nothing, no sooner had vaccination been introduced and shown to be hugely effective than we had an anti-vaccine movement. So how did we combat infectious disease to change from the pre-1990s to the 1990s situation? And the first and perhaps the most important mechanism was public health. Um, the enforcement of public health is very variable, and there's often a conflict, which we will see to this day, between the libertarians um, and the utilitarians, where libertarians believe that they can do anything they like other than those actions protected by law, and the utilitarians believe in the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, Sorry, a clean water supply uh, is not contentious, and even the most libertarian people uh, would not uh, allow people to contaminate the water supplies by using the sewage disposal. And effective sewage disposal is also not contentious, though it took a long time to be actually become effective. Great Britain in the 19th century, there was something called the Great Stink, which affected Parliament, which finally persuaded them to provide the money for a modern sewerage system to be built in London. Food hygiene, I beg your pardon, food hygiene is, 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 is sometimes contentious and sometimes not contentious. But in general, I mean, it is contentious, for example, to chlorinate chickens, which they do in America and which the European Union considers to be improper. But the idea that food should be hygienic in general is not contentious. Sexual hygiene gets all mixed up with religious views on procreation and is certainly contentious and the use of condoms, which is hugely important in spreading, or was hugely important in spreading this 
containing the spread of sexually transmitted diseases um, was rejected, and still is rejected by, for example, parts of the Catholic Church. Vector control, um, that is variable, but in general is not terribly contentious. Vaccination, which is probably the most effective, or second most effective method of controlling infectious disease, unfortunately remains contentious to this day, and we'll say a bit more about this. And the third most important method is antimicrobial drugs, antibiotics, antiviral drugs, and antiparasitic drugs, which have made a huge difference. But unfortunately, antibiotic abuse is a major public health problem, giving rise to a lot of drug resistant pathogens. It has to be fought against. Vaccination, which is an immunologist I'm particularly interested in, is probably the most effective intervention for improving human health. Origins were empirical, I've explained to you. Vaccine development remains important, as you may realize about COVID-19. So does the attempt to overcome vaccine rejection, which is always with us still. The great figure in the development of vaccination is really Louis Pasteur, who was a, a chemist and became a microbiologist he disproved the spontaneous generation of life by showing that if you put things into a swan necked flask so that bacteria from the air can't get into it, they remain sterile. He was very effective in disseminating the germ theory of disease. He attempted attenuation of pathogens by growing them under normal conditions, and he reduced vaccines against chicken cholera anthrax, and perhaps most importantly against rabies. He was probably the first to understand what immunization was really about. And he's also very important because he was a very effective publicist of his disease, and his work therefore had a major effect on society. The varieties of vaccines we have now are bacterial toxoids, which work very well, diphtheria and tetanus being the classic examples killed whole organisms, live attenuated organisms, BCG, of course, is tuberculosis, yellow fever, the Sabin polio virus, measles, mumps, and rubella, which unfortunately became controversial with Andrew Wakefield. The first recombinant protein vaccine was the hepatitis B surface antigen made by Biogen and really done by Ken Murray. And vaccine or other based virus vaccines which are still waiting, really, being used in man, which is hugely successful in the case of rabies, in eradicating rabies from Western Europe, going further north in Western Europe. And Pierre Paul Pastre was very much involved with this. They made originally chicken's heads, or recently sort of rather more less offensive looking pellets, which they dropped by aeroplanes in this countryside where foxes and other carriers of rabies were there to eat them. They always had scratches in their faces and they became immune. And this has been hugely effective in lowering the spread of rabies, which had been going north throughout France in a rather alarming way. This is just to give you an example of the development of vaccines. And there's no need to go through these one by one, but you see smallpox, uh, about 1880, long before we knew anything about antibodies or the immune system or anything. Rabies from Pasteur uh, in the late 1800s. But then it really is after the second, after the First World War that they get immune into between 1918 and 1985, this immense introduction of different vaccines and the huge effect that they have. This is just to give you an account of the effectiveness of vaccines, this is a bit out of date. It's from the American CDC. You can see, if you just look at the last column, this is the cases in 1995 and the maximum cases of pre-vaccine. The effectiveness of vaccination at the lowest, it's 98.37% in pertussis, and its highest is with polio with 99.99%. 
So it's hugely effective. The total number of adverse effects, most of which are trivial, these are not serious adverse effects, of all vaccination over all these years comes to about 11,000. But the clinical effectiveness of vaccination is absolutely enormous. Unfortunately, we still have huge trouble with anti-vaccines campaigns. Pertussis vaccine and brain damage, that is not causal. Pertussis vaccine does occasionally cause people to have uh, a seizure. But the people who have brain damage are always people who have predisposing disease. And it's much less so with modern pertussis vaccines. Hepatitis B vaccine and vaccine. sclerosis, that is an association which has only been reported in France and doesn't seem to occur anywhere else. Okay, so MMR with autism and inflammatory bowel disease, the Andrew Wakefield affair, um, he was struck off the British Medical Register as a result of um, improper behavior with regard to this. But unfortunately, the rejection of MMR, even in highly civilized, one imagines countries, as well as other parts of the world, has given rise to a considerable increase in measles which is actually quite a dangerous disease, particularly with his malnutrition. Um, the final one is to hear polio vaccine and the origin of HIV, the idea that the original polio vaccines may have contained HIV. Like what Edward Hooper wrote a novel, novel a book, it is really a novel, uh, uh, called The River about this, and it's completely untrue. From what I've already told you, there are quite two quite different HIV vaccines. They originate in different places. And where the polio vaccine was available, they were shown not to have any HIV. But Edward Hooper hasn't given up on it. The influenza vaccine, guillain barre syndrome. Well, virus infections can occasionally cause guillain barre syndrome. Um, and it's much rarer with the vaccine than it is with the disease. Yeah, you know, I just don't want to go on too long, but this is a rather rational letter written in 1828 by somebody in Worcester uh, protesting against people not having their children immunized against smallpox. It contrasts strongly. I'm not reading it to you. In 2007, when a woman called Ingrid Castle uh, put onto the web, scientist website, uh, this extreme case for anti-vaccine, saying, for example, anyone with eyes to see can witness the vital health of the unvaccinated as compared to the excessively vaccinated peers. Mm -hmm. But if there wasn't the necessary uptake of vaccines, there wouldn't be the endless drugs to treat the adverse reactions. The disease industry is quite profitable. After all, people pay their doctors when they're sick and not with optimal wellness. Unbelievable that people should still be putting this rubbish out, but it's still about. And I want to turn to a slightly different subject, which is the influence of infection on human genetic polymorphisms. Most human genetic polymorphisms you find in different societies are in fact associated with resistance to disease. Resistance to malaria, often of a quite trivial kind, is given by sickle cell disease, which prevents babies dying from it. The thalassemias, other diseases of hemoglobin, I can also give some re reduction in malaria in childhood, and so does G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Cystic fibrosis heterozygotes, as I said, have increased resistance to cholera, and there are many, many uh, infections associated with the major cystic ability locus, uh, where there are associations with T cell reactivity. Some of these are very extreme. If you have B27, your chance of getting ankylosing spondylitis is between 5 and 15 percent. If you are DR2 positive, you don't get good Fausto's disease ever. Um, the hemoglobinopathies, which are uh, very common, were selected for when the Mediterranean basin had a lot of malaria. They don't do that anymore because the capacity of the carrier has been eradicated, and the hemoglobinopathies remain a major burden for them. And there are two ways that have been used to try to reduce their incidence. 
Even the Roman Catholic Church agrees to the former one, which is that all young adults should be tested, the hemoglobinopathy genes. If they're heterozygous, they should forbid them to marry. There are two problems with this approach. One, it's not very effective. People, on the whole, um, uh, don't respond to advice from a, who they're not going to mate with. And secondly, it increases the allele frequency and may therefore be called dysgenic. Doesn't help make perpetuates the problem. The second mechanism would be to test all fetuses for their genetic status and abort homozygotes or perhaps even heterozygotes very early. Um, in the disease when there's really no proper fetus yet present at all by testing for this in the fetal cells and maternal blood. This effect is, would be effective and it would be eugenic because it would decrease the allele frequency by getting rid of both homozygotes and perhaps heterozygotes. The objection to this eugenic approach Injection to early abortion largely among the Roman Catholic, who believe that the embryo requires full human status at the moment of conception. That's a recent Catholic dogma founded by Pope Pius IX. In English, he's called Pope Pio Nono, which always seems to be rather appropriate, in 1869, and has never been uh, Aris, this is not, replaced the Aristotelian view, which um, made this much later at a time really when the woman is first aware of the fetus's existence. It was probably a misplaced attempt to bring the church dogma in line with 19th century embryology. But if so, you should have continued doing that because it wasn't known at that time to anybody that the great majority of fertilized eggs should even implant in the uterus. And since these implanted never implanted fertilized eggs and had no opportunity to sin, they would form the major population of either heaven or limbo, depending what sort of Catholic you are. A concept that I don't believe many modern Catholics would agree to. The term eugenics has also come under considerable controversy. It was coined when Galton defined the study of agencies under social control may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. And that's actually an unfortunate definition. Uh, and it led to the sterilization of the mentally defective or the racially undesirable, uh, particularly in some totalitarian states. And as a eugenic strategy was a moral aberration, as well as a failure to understand genetics. So eugenics is now either used to describe strategies to reduce the gene pool of values giving serious inherited disease, or as a term of unabused, undefined abuse against human dignity. The media always use the former definition. Now let's just see what are the consequences of our mortality having reach this 1990s figure pattern. The consequences are firstly a great increase in population. Secondly, as we've become more and more aware of global warming with considerable dangers. And the religious prescriptions which we've had, which were advantageous when we were an endangered species and were increasing our numbers was important, have now actually become very counterproductive in a recent age when mankind has become an endangering species and religious prescriptions have to adapt to this, which they have been very slow to show any sign of doing. The remaining threats we have from infectious disease, I've already mentioned most of them, the rejection of vaccination, antibiotic use, there are parts of the country where antibiotics can simply be bought over the counter and other places where GPs are pressured into giving them for virus infection, all of which is very dangerous since development of new antibiotics has slowed down a great deal. Global travel has problems because it enables infections to spread very rapidly around the world, COVID-19 being a very good example, and always the danger of biological warfare. So I wrote this before COVID, but it's still here to, today. The last half century may be seen as the golden age of freedom from infectious disease. 
On the other hand, it's just possible that science and human ingenuity may triumph over the present threat. And I just want to say a couple of things about COVID-19. This is not the easiest slide to follow. I want to point out to you, the only data you can believe, you're talking to somebody who used to be with the College of Pathologists, the only data you can believe uses death certificates only to tell you the age, sex of the person who died. What it says in diagnosis never means anything very much. And these are the weeks of this first pandemic. And if you look, these are the number of monthly deaths, weekly deaths, sorry, in the different weeks. And these are those of the five-year average beforehand. And the third one is the difference between them. And you can see until the 15th of March, we'd actually had a good year. There were almost in total 5,000 less deaths than in the first three months. And then it changed completely. And there was this huge number of increased deaths, almost 12,000 of them in two weeks in April, before it then rapidly come down again. And it turned negative again on the 19th of June. And in this period between the 20th of March and the 12th of June, there were an extra 59,234 deaths, which is approximately 0.1% of the population. This is more than the figures you will get in anywhere officially. Of course, these deaths may not all be due to COVID-19 itself, but uh, associated deaths because people can get treated for other diseases. It's a much more accurate estimate. Um, than the rather smaller estimate from people who have COVID-19 or their death certificates. However, this is still only 0.1% of the population. Compare that to the Black Death, which killed 30, 40% of the population over 45 years. In my last slide, I've just put this in a graph for you. These are the weeks of this year. This is the first wave, and that's over as far as deaths are concerned. Of course, infection, you'd have to push it back probably two or three months. But between the 3rd of January and the 26th of June, we had this enormous spike of deaths, which had a maximum of over 11,000 deaths, and has now come down again. So the first wave is um, satisfactorily being contained. But we must be aware of a second wave and not let our guard down at all. And that is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lippmann. Was such an insightful talk where you covered right from uh, 100 years old problem statement and you have come down to 2020. So the session is uh, open for questions. I'll take up a few questions which have been posted in the chat section itself. Uh, one Shubham Agarwal, he's asking, uh, can you please explain uh, the vaccine scares again? <laughs> um, no, I mean, vaccine scares is a sign of human irrationality, but it does go back, as you can see from the time that vaccination was first introduced by Jenner. There are always people who believe that things that are done for the good majority may harm the individual and the libertarians. And this goes to surprising people believe that vaccination and similar public health measures should not be compulsory. If you're asking me to explain why people like Ingrid Castle held these ridiculous views, um, that is totally beyond me. But I mean, it is a widespread phenomenon. I'm afraid it's widespread in the United States at the present time. The scientific evidence is treated with suspicion. And there are people who believe that what they get from completely unsubstantiated statement on popular media uh, gave me equal validity. And when you have heads of state that make similar remarks, it's not, you realize where the trouble is. It's not a surprise the United States with Donald Trump and Prince Hill with Bolsonaro, who both have leaders who have denied the existence even of this is a serious problem, um, are the countries that are the highest levels. But the answer to your question, can I explain vaccine rejection? The answer is no. <laughs> okay, okay. So the next question is by Dr. Balaji. Fear and future of COVID-2019 on human being. Sorry, could you say that again? 
the fear and the future of covid 19 on human beings <laughs> i wish i knew i mean what the data so far shows is a that it's extremely contagious and spread around the world in quite an enormous way uh, it has a complicated pathogenesis which we don't quite understand yet but which may lead to reasonably successful treatments in the not too distant future there are some quite remarkable findings there's a finding from china that COVID-19 directly binds one of the enzymes of the complement system, MASP2, and may therefore invoke the complement system into the pathogenesis. There's a couple of very interesting patients who are agamic globulinemic, uh, are infected with the virus and have no symptoms, again suggesting that the immune response may play some important part in actually generating the disease. So it is hoped that effective methods of treating it will come about. Making a vaccine may actually be quite difficult because there are situations with these viruses when antibodies can make the disease worse rather than better. So more ingenious methods of perhaps giving antibodies in one way or another where you have selected ones that can't do any harm but do cause immunity at best. And it may be that stimulating T cell activity in some way because it is old people who have poor T cell function may they do this. So I think on the longer term, one may imagine that human science may get the better of it. But in the meantime, there is this problem of getting people to behave sensibly. And whether one will be able to do that is a, is another question. But it's quite clear the countries in the Far East who are used to dealing with sort of infection have done very well. Um, some countries in Europe have done better than others. Britain did very badly to start with, was improved a great deal since, as you've seen. And you'll have to tell me how well they're doing in India. Oh, because I don't have accurate statistics here for that. But um, I would be, I think, optimistic that in due course, uh, some control of this will be got. But how much damage will do in the meantime, I would care to predict. Okay. I'll take up the next question. That is by Rajiv Dev. When there was no vaccine developed against smallpox, cowpox was used as natural vaccine until the modern smallpox, smallpox uh, vaccine emerged in the 19th century. So can it be possible in case of COVID, as many coronavirus infection in animals are not zoonotic, can it be used as prophylactic against human coronavirus? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think this, the analogy between cowpox and smallpox uh, is probably exact. There are coronaviruses that, for example, affect cats, that don't affect humans. And I mean, to see whether this could be the basis of uh, a vaccine is certainly something which should be investigated in vitro. I'd hesitate to inject this into humans too readily. But I mean, it's an interesting idea. Okay. So I'll take up the next one in that case. That is by Akansh Agarwal. How would the demographic distribution of a population influence the spread of an infection? Oh, well, I mean, enormously, of course. I mean, people who live in isolated communities and have very little contact with other people um, uh, are often or were until much modern transport relatively resistant uh, diseases occur elsewhere. I mean, one of the classic examples uh, was the Faroe Islands, which as you know are to the north of Scotland, deep in the sea there, and have a very localized population. And because they had cattle, they didn't allow the import of dogs. And they didn't have measles. Um, uh, they really didn't have endemic measles. And they had an epidemic of measles when the British Army, with or without their dogs, came into possession of the British Fair Islands, of the Fair Islands in the Second World War. So they had been a sufficiently small population that endemic measles couldn't be sustained and therefore they had an epidemic when it was introduced from outside 
and examples of this sort, I'm sure, occur elsewhere as well. That there are places where isolation gives you some form of it's not immunity really, but the inability to maintain a disease. Um, the coming of air, air travel on an enormous scale has made such places much rarer. Um, so now one is probably reliant on having really good public health services, which you know involves testing, isolation, and all the things that are now being done by COVID-19. And what is probably particularly important is that one has an effective public health system, which actually has legally binding powers. Um, and it is countries where this is very much rejected on libertarian grounds, who have had considerable difficulty with this infection. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take up the next one. There are three, four more questions. Uh, which country, as per your perception, would come up with COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that, that is not a question I could possibly answer. <laughs> okay. Hopefully it will be done by international collaboration. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, makes... you may tell me, the questioner may tell me, is there an Indian uh, prospective vaccine being made? Yes, yes. The efforts are going on in India and the ICMR is very active and they are going in for the trials next month and hope that they will be announcing something by the August and what are the stages in which the trials they have reached up to. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, the problem with the problem with vaccines against COVID-19, which is why you have to be so careful, is the phenomenon known as ADE, which is antibody-dependent enhancement. There is quite reasonable evidence in a number of papers that it may well be that the virus, when it cannot enter cells through the ACE2 inhibitor in the usual way, can enter cells using antibody and the FC receptor. And you do have to be very careful when you're devising vaccines that you don't, by accident, devise a vaccine that actually makes it worse. And there are some ingenious um, vaccine strategies now being explored, um, which have this in mind. But some of the early ones, which people put into, um, into use because they were based on the earlier SARS viruses, which are rather different because they had a much higher mortality and less spread, uh, may not have been a totally good idea. Okay, I'll take up the next one. Uh, that is by Veena Salvi. Is there any correlation with ethnicity and vaccines? Oh, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I mean, there are populations that have higher or lower frequencies of certain genes, which may, may have some relationship to um, how one responds to a particular vaccine. I'm not sure they're tremendously good examples, but one coming from my own field of research, the major component of complement is 3 has a major single amino acid difference, which distinguishes C3F or fast to C3S or slow. Now, C3F is a Caucasoid gene. It's probably about 10,000 years old. Um, and it is confined to Europeans and to Northern Indians. Um, and it is not seen in entirely Oriental or entirely black populations in as much as they still exist. Um, and there was a classical, this is a little bit not true of vaccines, more about infectious disease. There was a very classical study, study by René de Vries on Dutch migrants to Suriname. And these Dutch migrants came with a few black slaves, um, but otherwise were all Dutch. And they were decimated by disease in the few years after they arrived. And when de Vries went back three or four generations later to have a look at them and to see what a change in their genome, uh, some of the more common immunoglobulin genes and MHC genes are commoner, 
but quite remarkably, the incidence of C3F, this hyperactive C3 gene, had doubled. So it shows resistance to resistance to disease, and to some extent, I imagine that they may therefore also play some response in, resist in response to vaccines. But um, I, if you're talking about COVID and the increased effect of COVID on a lot of minority populations, I think that probably has different explanations. It's not largely genetic. But I mean, there may be some genetic influence. Okay, okay. So I'll come to the second last question. Uh, it, I'll, I'm mixing two, three questions at the same time. So one is by Amit Segal, the other is by Saranavati, and then is by Reval Singh. So are we live carriers as we are getting vaccines on a regular basis? And is herd immunity possible for as a solution for COVID-19? And why the symptoms of COVID-19 are different in different countries? <laughs> the answer to most of that is, sorry for that again, I, I don't know. Say that again, sorry, there was quite a lot in that. Yeah, I, I'll take a one. So are we live carriers as we are getting vaccines on a regular basis? What do That's you mean by life carriers? I don't understand. I mean, like so human beings, when we are vaccinated and we uh, we are moving out from here and there. So in that context, I suppose he's asking that question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm being stupid. I don't understand what he's asking me. Of course, if we've been vaccinated, our immune system has been changed I mean, in a way that it yeah. could have been if we'd had the infection and recovered from it. But by doing this, by vaccination, we have achieved similar changes, or perhaps even better changes, without the risk of the disease in the first place. Okay, okay. So uh, I'll take up the second part. Is herd immunity a possible solution for COVID-19? Well, uh, of course it's a possible solution. If you have, if you can, by vaccination, generate enough people that the spread of the virus is seriously inhibited. In other words, the R number becomes extremely low and you will acquire herd immunity and the virus will probably go away when it can no longer spread. Uh, whether that is achievable with the current vaccination, um, we will have to wait and see. It may okay. happen spontaneously. If enough people get infected, recover, and have reasonably long-lasting immunity, whether it be from T-cells or antibodies, then you may acquire this normally. But the, the spread of the infection at the moment doesn't necessarily show that any, you know, certainly in this country, the number of people a random sampling who are positive is quite still much too low for herd immunity. Okay. So, uh, why COVID-19 symptoms are different in different countries? Um, are they? Um, uh, I think there's a huge variety of symptoms. And I'm not sure that is true. I'm not sure that data is yet available. I mean, if you look at the data I know of, which is largely here local, the amount, the severity and the difference of symptoms is enormous. Um, but I don't know of systematic differences between other countries. So if there is such data, I'm afraid I don't know it. Okay. Uh, I'll take up perhaps the last question. Uh, do we have true asymptotic carriers of COVID-19 existing right now? This is by Veena Salvi. Oh, I think so. I mean, there is population testing going on with such antibody tests as we have, which are not hugely satisfactory. And there certainly do seem to be people who do not know that they've had the disease who have antibodies. So some such people certainly exist, but how frequent they are remains to be seen. Okay. Okay, I think that we have taken more than uh, it's already crossed that one hour. And uh, on behalf of uh, Nasi Delhi chapter and MHRD Institution Innovation Council, the India Lupadhyay College, I would like to thank Professor Peter, uh, who has given more than one and a half hours for this uh, uh, talk.
and perhaps have answered nearly all the questions. Well, the questions came out coming up, and and at uh, it's around five forty-five in India. And any concluding remarks from your side, sir? Then I'll close the session. No, thank you very much for listening. Always a privilege to talk to an Indian audience, and I only wish I could see you. <laughs> sure. So if you can uh, stop presenting, then you will be able to see all of us. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, uh, you have to, sir, uh, stop presenting. Uh, you can Intro. press escape. You can press escape. Yeah, yeah. So you can minimize the window. So there have been huge round of compliments which are there. I can see you now. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So so there are more than 120 attendees which were there. And uh, we have uh, professors uh, from yeah all across uh, India itself. And uh, I request, uh, there are two professors. One is Professor Riddhi Shah, uh, who is from JNU. Uh, Ma'am, you can go ahead, please, if you have something to share. Thank you very much, sir. Can we please clap for them? Sure, 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 sure. Everybody should unmute and then. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can unmute yourself. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.